Hi everyone, thank you for joining us for Behind the Lens, the fashion industry, beauty ideals, and eating disorders. My name is Ellen Domingos, I'm the Community Outreach Specialist at the National Eating Disorders Association. I'm here with author, speaker, and proud to be me manager, Claire Misko. Hello. So in recognition of Need Awareness Week 2014, the National Eating Disorders Association has teamed up with the Model Alliance to present this live Google Hangout. We're so fortunate to have with us today Nita Ambassador, Model Alliance Advisory Board Member, Model Activist and Author Carrie Otis, and we also have Model and Activist Brittany Mason. And I will be um, properly introducing them in a moment, but I just want to kind of go over what we'll be talking about today. So we really want to explore the connection between the fashion industry beauty ideals, the pressures consumers face to satisfy these unrealistic expectations, and how these contribute to the onset of eating disorders and body image issues. And Brittany and uh, Carrie will also discuss the changes that are happening within the fashion industry um, uh, to better protect working models, healths and rights, as well as, as exploring what consumers can do to promote positive change. So before we get into all of that, I want to introduce our two amazing panelists. Carrie Otis published her memoir, Beauty Disrupted, in 2011 with HarperCollins Publishers. She's a regular guest blogger on multiple reputable publications. She's passionate about the dangerous impact subversive media messaging has on our culture, especially young women, but also enjoys writing on topics related to health, nutrition, relationships, sexual intimacy, mind-body connection, and spirituality. As a world-famous model in the 80s and 90s, Carrie grew increasingly concerned about unfair labor practices and poor working conditions in the modeling industry and has since become an advocate for young women in and out of the industry. She's on the advisory board of the Model Alliance, a nonprofit industry group working to establish fair labor standards for models in the U.S as well as uh, working as an ambassador for the National Eating Disorders Association. Welcome, Carrie. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you. I'm so glad to be able to be here with you all. And next we have Brittany Mason. Brittany signed her first modeling contract at the age of 16 and shortly thereafter entered a local beauty competition that led her to capture the Nationals title of Teen Model of the USA for the World Beauty Organization. Brittany is an advocate for several charitable organizations. As a teen, she created a bullying awareness and safer school initiative program and continues to produce educational fundraising events for the cause. In 2012, she studied fashion law at Fordham Law School under Susan Scaviti to further her goal to improve the industry and establish fair and ethical working rights for all models. Hi, Brittany. How are you? Thanks Hi. for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. Excellent. So let's get into it. Um, we want to start first with talking about the fashion industry and the impact on consumers and models. Now, we, we often see underweight young models um, modeling clothing for grown women. And this uh, often has a negative impact on both adult consumers and the youth who believe they should look like these peers. Uh, Carrie, I know that models generally start at a very young age. Um, would you be able to talk more about the impact of having such young models entering the fashion industry? Yeah, I, I really believe that the challenges are, you know, when you have young young women in the industry and being employed at such a young age, obviously it is um, it's a challenge because this is a very adult industry to be entering, but also I think that the message that it's giving off in a way, you know, that media-wise and the millions of images that are out there, that the majority is kind of re saying that the majority of women are very young. It's representing us as very young and then also we could get into the whole parts of airbrushing within the industry, but it's also representing a very inaccurate, you know, wide-range picture of us as women. 
Um, also, of course, the onset of eating disorders is, you know, oftentimes comes very young in life. So to have, um, be in an industry where the pressures to be thin are part of the job requirements can be a very dangerous place for a young working model that might not have the tools and the support to be able to differentiate between what's healthy and what's a job demand, um, you know, the expectations of them. Yeah, and I want to get into a little bit more of uh, a couple of the things you just mentioned uh, in a moment, but Brittany, um, we know that you started your modeling career at the age of 16, which it's hard to believe is a bit older for, for most models um, uh, who start at a much younger age. How have you seen the impact of entering the industry at such a young age influence the perception of how young women perceive their bodies and each other's? Well, it definitely plants a seed uh, for someone who starts in the modeling industry. I mean, I myself was always naturally had a small frame. So when I, after signing my first contract, you know, I was told that I was too big and I needed to lose weight. I had never looked at myself like that before, and I think that that's common for, you know, a lot of models that enter the industry because, you know, you are so young, so your body hasn't really filled out yet. You haven't really hit puberty yet. So, um you know, it it just automatically plants a seed and you look at your body entirely different and, um, you know, you take different measures to stay as thin as, as what you have to, even when your body is changing and you're growing up in this industry. And, um, yeah, it's, it just, it becomes unhealthy. The, you know, I want to, I want to point out that um, the waif look has been, you know, what's common that we see in the industry for um, for so long now, I'd say like around since the 90s, and the word waif itself um, in old literature, it means malnourished or frail appearance, and this is what we're aspiring, you know, to be. This is what we're projecting out from the fashion world, and I don't feel, you know, a frail appearance should be in the same sentence with you know, woman. I mean, when I think of woman, I want to envision someone who's healthy and empowered and and strong, and that's how I envision women. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to see the things that are changing in the industry with these sorts of pressures. Yeah. Thanks so much, Brittany. Well, we don't, we don't have a male model on the panel today, but I, I do want to actually talk a little bit about how these pressures might affect male models and also male consumers. Um, have you seen, and I want to ask each of you, I'll start with you, Carrie, have you seen the impact of fitting the crazy standards um, influencing male models that you've worked with and is it as, as scrutinizing and um, as intense pressure for, for women models? I, I think it's definitely as intense and the demands are the same. They might be a little bit the demands might be a little bit different, but I think the pressures are the same. Um, and and also really unrealistic. I believe that we saw a difference um, in men and eating disorders and this expectation of what a guy's body should look like when we started to see Rambo and we started to see Jean-Claude Van Damme and, and people were, guys were in different states of undress and we would see, you know, covers of magazines or advertisement, which we still see today. With, you know, one thing would be like a really buff body, chiseled torso, you know, no, you know, six pack of abs, or again moving into this sort of waif-like look, which also we're seeing like a more emaciated male at this point. Either, either way, it's sending a message to men that you're supposed to, and to boys, that you're supposed to look a certain way. That you need to look a certain way to, for models, obviously, to get a job, to maintain a career, as well as for guys just fitting into expectations, cultural expectations. And I think eating disorders for men have been around for quite a while, um, pretty hush-hush and not really discussed. And now it's becoming quite a big subject within treatment of eating disorders. Um, and I've also heard that the treatment of eating disorders is very tapered to women and to girls and so there's kind of a gap within treatment and also I think a lot of shame I mean there's a lot of shame associated with eating disorders I think it's even more pressure for our male friends um, and it's very real 
So I do know guys, models that have had, had eating disorders, and I know the pressures from male athletes, um, jockeys. I mean, it, it's definitely out there, and I think it can be career-driven, but not only career-driven. Mm -hmm. It's cultural. The expectation is there. Yeah, and that's an important point you raised, Carrie. I mean, we know that a third of all eating disorders um, or eating disorder cases are men. So, you know, we have to really talk about that and address that. And I, I'd like to get your thoughts on this, uh, Brittany. Do, is, it, does what Carrie says resonate with you and your experience in the industry? Absolutely. I feel that men especially struggle with coming forward and discussing, you know, the pressures um, that they go through as far as body image. Because men in general, I mean, the society's pressure on them is just always, you know, to be the strong, a strong male, um, you know, not, you know, not speak up about those sorts of things. So it's it's already difficult to discuss in the first place. And then, you know, being being a man, I can't, I can't even imagine um, how difficult it would be to open up about about that. So I hope that there, yeah, there should be more focus on um, bridging that gap between treatment and, and males. So, and you, you've both worked in the industry extensively. How pervasive would you say eating disorder behaviors are in order to stay in the industry and continue to work? And I'd love to hear from Carrie um, about your experiences in the 80s and 90s, and then Brittany about your experiences in the 2000, 2000s. And where do you think we are presently? Um, you know, I really appreciate what Brittany had to say of sort of entering the modeling world and, you know, all of a sudden there's this, you know, expectation or view of your body and a demand that um, can be somewhat devastating as well, you know, for a, a young kid, 15, 16, 17, when somebody, anybody comments on your physical body and it has to do with a work situation where you're told you're too fat to get into the clothes, you're going to be dismissed from the job because you don't make the certain criteria, not only does it hit your sense of self-esteem, self-worth, but oftentimes kids aren't, of course, equipped with the tools to make any healthy changes or make changes in a healthy way. So oftentimes that can be a trigger for an eating disorder just by way of how you go about solving that huge problem. Like, oh my gosh, what do I do? I don't know what to do. I'm going to stop eating. So, you know, when I was in the industry in the late 80s, 90s, um, and early 2000s, there was absolutely, you know, a blanket expectation that you showed up for a job in a sample size. Um, that is completely unnatural for me. I'm 5'10", I'm now 140, you know, I'm, I'm a strong gal and I always have been. So that expectation was there for me throughout my career and something that I struggled with just to be able to maintain, you know, the jobs and, and the sort of caliber, quote unquote, of the, top, the bigger jobs. Um, and the girls that I saw around me, you know, there's so many varying body types and metabolism. So there was a lot of girls that it wasn't an issue, you know, at all in any way. And as Brittany pointed out, a lot of these girls haven't fully hit puberty. They've just sort of are cruising through and it's naturally a time where you're burning really high and your metabolism is running really high and a lot of changes haven't happened yet. So that also can be quite devastating during that period, especially if it's in front of the camera where that natural change happens, your body shifts, you become, you know, a powerful, wonderful, fuller figured human being for a reason, but it doesn't quite fit into those industries' expectations. So there were a lot of young people that I worked with that had a lot of anxiety around that expectation of them. And I can't speak for, you know, how many girls had eating disorders, but I also know that for many of us, the practices to show up on a job, especially during fashion shows, you know, was to take, you know, was it wasn't a healthy way that we got there and tried to maintain that place. So it was sort of the perfect feeding ground for, for me, definitely to continue an eating disorder, but to feed, feed eating disorders in that sense. Right, and you, you bring up an important topic about um, young women and puberty and the changing bodies and we'll get into that a little bit um, later but Brittany would love to hear your thoughts on your experiences uh, during your career. 
Yeah, I mean, starting so young, it's such a critical time, you know, being a, a young a young teen and, and not hitting puberty yet, and then, you know, looking at your body in a different way. Um, you know, in the in the 2000s, um, you know, it was it was models were shrinking more and more. I mean, I just I feel like over time we've seen them shrink so much. I mean, um, and the pressures that I mean I had for my agency. They, it was when I started. It was when the Atkins diet was really common. So it was a really you know the fad diet at the time, and my agency had me you know start on that, and then. Um, that I mean that that just automatically you know planted a seed and I mean I, I went to the extremes you know you, you learn to do what you have to do to stay the size that you need to and if something works you know it's gonna spread like wildfire which are models you know well this works for me to lose weight so you know you should try it too and um, you know how models have shrunk you know so much in the you know throughout time I I would say um, a couple years after I, I started, there were two girls that passed like passed away that died from anorexia mm -hmm. in Europe. Um, one was literally on the runway, and 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 died. And something like that happening in the industry, you would think that it would impact, you know, the industry to make these changes. But it's taking so long to see these changes, and and it's it's just much slower than what it should be. But um, finally, after all these years, now we're seeing more models like you know, like Crystal Wren and Kay Upton. And we're seeing fuller, figured models. Um, but it's just it's just taking a really long time and much slower than how it should be. So we're gonna um, shift from here, talking about some of the issues that around. Um, de-glamorizing the fashion industry and we you know as consumers we're sort of privy to the glossy beautiful final pictures in the magazines and the billboards and don't always know really what goes on behind the scenes um, I think there's a lot more talk now about Photoshop and some of the practices within the industry people consumers are starting to become more aware of that but you know there's a whole other aspect of it in terms of the vulnerability to exploitation and you know both of you have talked about um, the issue of how young um, most models are when they get into the industry and the whole issue of child child labor basically and both of you have um, been involved with the Model Alliance and we're going to talk a lot more about the work that's being done through the Model Alliance to address some of these issues. Um, and both, both of you have have um, addressed this issue of youth and body image. I, I, I wonder if you can expand on that a little bit. Um, how, what do you see as the connection between extreme youth um, and, and body image in terms of getting involved in, in the industry at a young age and how that impacts body image? Carry on. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, I look. I I have two daughters, so I have. I have, my daughters are five and seven. I have a different lens that I'm looking at advertisement today, and there's definitely such an element that's quite reckless um, of how we are representing our kids, our our youth. I mean, the premature sexualization that is going on. You know. It's it's really it's really tricky. You've got the girls within the industry, super duper young, that are out there doing ads for you know wrinkles, for cellulite creams. You know the fact of the matter is none of these girls have wrinkles. They don't have cellulite. It's, it's not an accurate depiction, and these images are not women that have overcome or that there's really this product that you know is actually working in this in this way. Um, but it does send a message to us. I mean, we cannot, we are not 17, a size 2 for this eternity. And so the lack of representation of women with gray hair, women with wrinkles, women that have different shapes of bodies, women of different color, um, really pushes into society this, this whitewash. And I talk a lot about, you know, this whitewash sort of, you know, media splash that's happening where the general depiction of women is is white 17 size 2 completely perfect and i'm so glad there is a discussion at this point you know about the airbrushing going on um, it was a little bit different when i was in the industry 
things were not as forgiving, but essentially, you know, at this point, most everything is tweaked to quite the extent, and we have great actresses and actors that are coming out, you know, Kate Winslet being one, um, They've, we've got great images of women before and after, like real images that women are bold enough, and, you know, to show and to share, so that we can really see what's going on behind the scenes, and that definitely has an impact in a subversive media messaging that that is sent out that we all receive, and we all buy the magazines and subscribe to it to a certain extent, unless there is this bigger dialogue going on, which is part of what today is about: is having that dialogue and getting it out there. Yeah, that's so important. And actually, we just got a question in from a user who's who's watching the uh, Hangout. Uh, and this one's for you, Carrie. You've spoken about the need to, to de-glamorize the industry, and I, I think that that's so important. Why, and this question is, why do you think people stay in the industry <laughs> if the, <laughs> the realities of the work environment are so difficult and, you know, some of the the messages that are being put out there um, are having a negative impact. What, what do you think? What, what do you think the reason is people stay in the industry? Oh, it's to me, it's really clear. You know, I was um, a dropout from high school, didn't have a home to go to. I got into an industry where I could make my living, and I didn't feel like I had a lot of options. And a lot of the young people that get into the industry, they're foregoing their, you know. It, to a lot of people, it's it's their chance, it's their shot, or they've traded this in for other options in their life. And I think, you know, it's so important to encourage a young model who's going into this industry to maintain a level of education and, you know, continue with their schooling. But a lot of humanity works on hopes, you know, hopes that they're going to be the one that might be able to make enough money to put them through college or to buy a home. And so, you know, I think it's a typical desire and grasping that, you know, they'll make it and that the industry pushes hope, you know. You've got a lot of agents behind you saying you're going to, if you hang in long enough, you know, if you diet hard enough, if you show up this way, you're going to be one of the ones. And there's a lot for a young person. I mean, for me, that was super enticing because I didn't have a lot else to hope for. So I think it's sort of a normal desire, especially for a vulnerable, susceptible young person. They're the perfect little, you know, folks to hook something into and reel them in. Absolutely. So I think there's a lot of that that's just natural that goes on. I absolutely agree with that, and I can relate a hundred percent with with what you just said because I was in the same position. I mean, I didn't feel. I mean, once I once I went to New York, I didn't feel like I had anything to go back to from where I was coming from, and um, yeah, it was a way to take care of myself, and um, yeah, just a, a hope for a better life, more opportunities. Um, I also I also quit high school. Um, yeah. I, I finished through homeschooling, but um, but then you know I mean I you know I could have gone back and you know had a better education you know, through college or whatever, but it was just like you know a lot of models you can't you can't balance all of that it's it's too much and you know I don't know I'm I'm sure you probably found this too Carrie but like every time I would get close to like wanting to quit or try to figure out something else. I would always get that one to <laughs> bring you back in, you know. So then it's it's like a love hate relationship, you know, with, with the industry. So it's like the quintessential dysfunctional like marriage or boyfriend, right? It's just yeah. so hard to maintain perspective, and also there's an element of your self esteem on a daily basis is being you're being rejected continuously and you're like there for the one hope that someone's gonna throw you a bone and just like love ya and that confirmation or affirmation comes through a job so yeah. it's a really dysfunctional and again we're dealing with kids it's not like you know we're dealing with 30 year olds or we're dealing with teenagers and early 20 somethings so it's completely you know beyond any of them and, and myself included at that age to differentiate and to maintain a perspective. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I, I always like to, I, I say it time and time again, if you want to talk to the most insecure person, talk to a model. <laughs> 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 Our yeah. job is to pick ourselves apart to be, you know, 
perfect to you know, get the job. There's a lot of competition out there. Um, and if we don't do that, someone else will. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So um, they also wanted to, um, with, like when we were talking about um, how young, um, you know, with body, body image, you know, how young um, and these advertisements, uh, through technology, you know, since technology has evolved, um, you know, I mean, younger kids have access to, you know, Instagram or Facebook, blah, 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 whatever, and they see, they see so much, you know, more than, you know, what, you know, nine or ten year olds were seeing, um, you know, ten years ago. I have an 11 year old cousin, and she was telling me one day that she felt she looked too fat. And I'm like, you're 11. Why are you even thinking about this right now? Yeah. Why are you looking at yourself like that right now? So I think it's even, you know, I mean, it's getting even younger with the image because, um, you know, advertising it's so accessible now, and it's just it's being bombarded at such a young age. Yeah, and, and just to to stay with um, the topic of young models and how they're vulnerable within the industry, I, I want to touch upon the lack of protection within the industry. Um, last year, we did a Need Awareness Week event with the Model Alliance um, inside the industry, and at that time, legal rights for working models it was still just an idea, but we've come a long way. Uh, since then, recently, there was a great success in having the child model law passed, which is great news. It puts in place protections for um, limiting work hours, um, mandatory financial trusts. Uh, uh, designers now have to fill out extensive paperwork if they're going to work with younger models. Um, they now have to have chaperones and tutors on set. Um, Carrie, how do you think this has impacted the, the fashion industry, and do you think other states will follow? And I, I also want um, to talk a little bit about protection for models in regards to their ability to stand up against sexual exploitation and still be able to work. So maybe you can both talk about that. We can start with Carrie. Yeah, I just I want to say it's so important for as many models out there to join the Model Alliance because it is a way, it is a resource, it is a way to get the support and be working uh, along with other people that are really concerned um, to be able to change change the industry. Uh, for me, when I was a model, you know, this was like a dream. I mean, I went, I moved all over the world completely unchaperoned, was in situations that were no place, no place for a young teenage girl. And I believe that these changes will, um, of course, they're going to benefit many. This is going to be really powerful. Um, Sorry, my daughter just came in. Hi, Jade. <laughs> I can pretend that did. It just happened. I'm like, there's a note for me. Um, yeah, okay, back on subject. So the changes, I mean, they're so, they're so, they're so needed, and this is a huge victory. Obviously, it's going to put a lot of uh, people who've been sort of just going, going for, look, we've, it's the one industry that, it's taken this long to get kids their their rights and to protect kids and that was where I was coming from through my career and becoming more outspoken the older that I got was I was one of those kids that was taken advantage of you know I was not paid the sort of transparency between client to agent to me I can't tell you how many years I didn't make money I constantly owed an agency so to have this in place where this is very real and there is protection and ethics and a code of conduct now for this industry is so fabulous and also that it's taken this long is appalling I mean it's just it's a shocker to me as mother to young girls at this point um, the sexual sexual exploitation I think that has taken place within that industry. I've written about it in my book after writing about it. Um, I can't tell you how many letters from women my age and from younger girls of the similar experiences being molested by agents, photographers, clients, and that there was this expectation that showing up on job meant you needed to give yourself up in some way that made you feel uncomfortable you know, sexually or in some other provocative way. And that, when I was in the industry, was just an expectation. And actually, 
I've had agents who, you know, I got in trouble when I didn't satisfy the client. So there was a very thin line. There was a very thin line with what it was to be within that industry. Now, you know, there within the Model Alliance, there is a place you can report sexual harassment. You can get the support that you need. And any young person, any person of any age that that encounters anything that happens to them that makes them uncomfortable, that's a violation of boundary, should be able to speak out, go to an adult, go to a therapist, go and get the support they need to report that as well as to be able to heal from that trauma. So the Model Alliance has that, that is so phenomenal and Brittany, I'll, I'll pass that along to your comment. No, I agree. It is appalling that it has taken so long to, you know, put proper laws in place and, and you know, for child models um, in this industry because it's been so unregulated for so long. Um, I also had encounters, um, you know, with, you know, sexual harassment or, you know, those things that are completely inappropriate that, um, no one should ever have to encounter uh, in a, you know, on a job. Um, I had an incident with a photographer, and because I didn't give in to the photographer, I ended up never working any job that he was associated with. Um, and it's, yeah, I mean, it's unfortunate. It's been unregulated for so long, but um, I prayed for something like the Model Alliance, you know, for the longest time I wanted something like that. But, you know, it's also, it's, it's a scary thing to come, you know, it's, it, it can be a very scary thing to come forward, um, you know, because just talking to your agency, I mean, you might be afraid, like, that you're, you're not going to work anymore, and, um, yeah. you know, the incident that I have with the photographer, but, you know, now that the Model Alliance exists, uh, you know, models can get the support that they need, so I really urge, uh, you know, all models to join the Alliance so we can, um, you know, really change the industry as a whole. Well, it's, it's so great that the two of you are speaking out about it, and um, it's brave, and you're giving uh, other models the courage to do the same. So, And we do know that, that the law is, is helping. It's working. I think right this past uh, Fashion Week, there weren't as many young models uh, walking the runway, um, which is great. It is great. I believe there was only four, if I'm correct. And, um, yeah, it's it's amazing. I mean, um, you know, the the law states that um, you know they they can you know models uh, under the age of eighteen they can only work eight hours per day and not two days in a row and um, you know under sixteen have to have a chaperone so it's a lot more work to um, you know have you know child models hired for jobs so this is it's a great thing there it's a great thing in that direction. Yeah, and also, I just have to say, I, you know, the Model Alliance, Sarah Ziff is revolutionary in the sense that, you know, that that's going to piss a lot of people off that they can't just dip into that, you know, pool with no regulations, you know. So that's a change that I don't think you know everybody is happy about, um, and yet it is such a great victory. And also going back to. I really don't think that the modeling industry is any place for girls under 18. I mean, to me, even 18 is questionable, but absolutely not younger than that. No, no young person should have their their that amount of emphasis placed on their physical body. You're still developing in so many ways that need to get really grounded in a solid foundation to be able to go out and conquer the world as empowered adults. Absolutely. Agreed. I think the Model Alliance has also done a really great job in, you know, forcing some conversations that need to happen um, and talking about what's actually going on and not being afraid uh, of the fallout from that, um, which, Carrie, as you pointed out, that's the, there, there have been a lot of very egregious things happening that have gone unchecked. Um, you know, one of the things that the Model Alliance recently pointed out was um, that there are contracts, there are certain contracts that state that models can't gain um, or grow a specific amount of centimeters um, and that, that this is actually written into the contracts. 
Uh, and Brittany, I'm wondering, have you heard of this? Do you want to talk about this? Um, is, is this something that, um, how is this being addressed now within the industry and have you ever encountered this? What, what are, what's your opinion? Yeah, um, I encountered it. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, if, if I got over a certain, you know, a, cert, a certain weight or certain measurements, I just wasn't sent out for casting. So I wasn't even able to have the opportunity to possibly have a job. Um, you know, so it's 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 always just been extremely vital that you watch, you know, your your weight. Um, but as far as now, the changes with it, I'm not really sure. Maybe maybe you know, Carrie, like exactly now, like the in contracts, because I, yeah, my I'm no longer with my agency anymore. I left um, my agency a year ago, so taking a break actually. Congratulations. <laughs> Um, what do I know? I, I can't speak, you know, currently, obviously, yeah, I, I mean, I write about one story um, where I was in Oprah Magazine and actually they wouldn't use the pictures because I was too quote unquote fat, you know, so I've definitely been dismissed from jobs um, and that was pre, I mean, they, it, it was always that the client actually could break contract with me. Um, as the model if I didn't show up, you know, whether that was specified in detail or not, there was an assumption made that I was to show up a certain way. Um, I have no doubt that there are contracts like that and I don't know the details of, of where that's at legally at this point. Um, I'm not sure. I can't speak to that. Yeah. Is somebody asking a question? Are we all on? <laughs> Hello? Can you guys hear us? Oh. I can't hear them. I don't hear them either. Uh oh. <laughs> I can hear you. <laughs> I can hear you too. <laughs> um, Ladies, we can't hear you. Uh oh. Uh-oh. Well, how are you? <laughs> hmm. uh, well, we could, I mean, I guess we could continue talking. Um, you know, do you have our talking? Do you have the whole um, Yes, I do. I do. Let's see. Um, oh, so how long have you been working with the Model Alliance? Um, you know, I met, I met Sarah. Um, it's funny. I... So back in 2010, or I'm sorry, back in 2011, I had the, a, a specific incident with a photographer, um, and then I wasn't working, you know, from any job that he was associated with, and I, um, I heard about the documentary that she did, and I, I'll never forget watching it, and I just sat glued to the screen, and I, I was in tears, and I was just... I was actually in my model apartment at the time <laughs> with um, my six other roommates and watching it and just, I, I couldn't believe it that, um, you know, she had the courage to, to put everything out there and finally, you know, all these truths about the industry are being put yeah. out there. Um, you know, because I lived in fear for so long about talking about any of this stuff because yeah. I'm in the industry. I'm still in the industry. So you cannot, you know, I absolutely could never speak of anything like that. So, um, you know, watching it, I just, I, I was, I was in tears. I was so excited and I immediately wanted to get in touch with her. I, I ended up getting in touch with her and she was telling me how she was going to start, you know, the Alliance soon. And, you know, we discussed what we wanted to see changed and, and everything. So, um, yeah. Great. That's great. Are you ladies back on with us? Can you hear us? Uh oh, there it just went out. Um, we can talk about how um, diversity on the runway was one of the topics that we um, were kind of discussing as well. Um, you know how um, in a study, nine to fourteen year olds, like forty six percent of girls and twenty seven percent of boys admitted to doing something to their appearance to look like a person that they saw in the media. Yeah. Um, so how are we going, you know, how can the industry promote, um, you know, diversity and acceptance in... 
I, you know, it to me, it so much goes back to the the need for and well, the lack of diversity within just advertisement alone, or any kind of editorial. So pretty much most of what we're seeing within the magazines and what that the industry is allowing out, pushing out, supporting, paying for is um, is this whitewashed, right? Oops, are you? Still, oh, ladies, are you there? I no. see. I can see everyone, but um, I can't hear them. I can still see you, but it's just a small, it's a small little, yeah. Like, you know. Um, if ladies, you can hear us, put your thumbs up. No. No, that's... Uh, Not a... Uh, well, okay, in hopes that we're still going live. Oh, oh thumbs up. Okay, cool. Okay. Um, you can okay. also email me some questions, gals. I've got my email right here. So, um... I think the need is the same that we need like an accurate representation and some diversity from I mean it's not just beauty it's not just weight it's age it's color it's all of it. it's humanity and it's it's so one way yeah. that kind of anywhere else it would be so blatant it would be so discriminatory Absolutely. and yet right yet yeah. within this oh, yeah. On the runway, it's like, oh, we've just got all of these 15-year-olds marching down, and they're the same size. And it's like, wow, it's so, it's like so old school. Again, it's like really baffling to me that we're even in this dialogue. Like, okay, wake up, come on, this is such yeah. an opportunity to put everybody up there and out there, and it's a rainbow of us. Come on, God's sake. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> You know, and then and the age thing is one thing that I will never, I have never understood. Why does it, what is the difference if you're 20 versus 22 that, you you know, for a job, you know? Right, I, right. What, is, what does that make? So you don't even want to see me because I'm 22 and, and not 20. But, you know, it, it's just, it's it's funny because... It's it's funny because you know I mean at a, there's girls at such a young age they look they do look older than than what they they are but um, I feel like those girls you know I feel I feel like you know once you get older like that kind of like levels off and right I, I just think it's ridiculous um, the it, it seems yeah it's it feels like it's an industry that definitely lives on labels and extremes and I remember when I, I started doing plus size modeling work because I was like oh, you know oh horror a size eight but for the industry it was plus size yeah which I wasn't I wasn't actually big enough to be you know like legitimately plus size so I was actually asked to wear padding and I was so and I said no. I'm like, look, you know, I was I was just to this point of my own empowerment of if I just can't be who I am, like beautiful, outspoken, the size that I am, I can't step into a, a padded suit for you people. So I think again, just like to bring back, you know, as a Buddhist, I say just like the middle ground, the middle path. Like we need to find a way to represent, to definitely diversify what we're putting out there and understand the impact that all of these images have. I mean, so you take your friend or friend's friend who's got a daughter who's 11 that's already talking about her weight. Yeah. You know, oftentimes it's not necessarily a dialogue in the household, although it can be, you know, mm -hmm. directly related to dieting, the mother's on it, who's looking at whose body and in, in what, what kind of way. But there's definitely a huge impact on these kids viewing all of these messages that they're receiving in the media. And today the media is everything from magazines, catalogs, commercials, television shows, movies, you know, the whole, you know, video games and how women are, or girls are represented in video games. You know, the damsel in distress. There's just so many ways that we're receiving messages and men and boys too. That it just, you know, across the board, it's just time to get a lot more responsible. And thank goodness for National Eating Disorder Association, a Model Alliance, and outspoken individuals like you and so many others, Emmy, that are just stepping up and continuing to dialogue about, let's face it, it's not popular or comfortable subjects. I mean, I'm definitely not the popular girl on the block after writing my book. And yet, yeah. having two little girls, I could not, you know? But mm -hmm. not. So. Yeah. I mean, I think yeah. that, um, you know, I, mean, I think that I can talk to, 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 to everyone who is talking about the wallet and 
you know, I um, I think it's gonna it's gonna take a lot of influential people uh, to you know to be a part of this change. Um, you know, and it'll trickle down. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, like this past fashion week, you know, we we saw more diversity in shows like Zach Posen show and Diane von Furstenberg. So um, you know, I think it's just gonna take it's gonna continue taking people like like them, like you, like us, and um, you know, just continue creating more awareness and, and keep putting the pressure on to create a, you know, a more healthy image. Yeah, and to applaud those designers and those advertisers that are taking that risk. You know, it's great and it's against the grain. Are you gals back with us now? I don't know. Can you hear us? Yeah, I can. You know, I mean, I. Did we lose Brittany? I think we lost Brittany. Darn! <laughs> Brittany, oh my goodness! Well, 